that you're going to hear about bugs and you will never look at a pond the same after hearing from Tom Bennett who's going to has a decades of uh, experience looking at insects. I'm Judy Lair Jacobs, the executive director of the Friends of the Blue Hills, and Don Bennett is amazing because he's out here in the rain with me. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, an entomologist. Uh, I got a master's degree at the University of Minnesota and a PhD at UConn, and even though I uh, discovered new drugs for humans, I have uh, I kept my contacts with the uh, curator of entomology, Jane O'Donnell, and uh, her husband, Eric Quinter, who is from the American Museum of Natural History. And they're both going to be out in Borderland on August 18th, Saturday, August 18th at 10 a.m. Um, for a close-up look at insects. It's a little damp today for a close-up look at insects. I, um, Unfortunately, we're not going to actually be looking at them today, but we will be talking about them and how they've changed. Um, the What, what um, Don has been seeing has changed over the last decade or two. Um, you are watching Blue Hills Alive, your weekly guide to the Blue Hills. And uh, if you have gone hiking in the rain, let us know with a yes or no in the comments below. This is sponsored by Tom O'Neill of Success Real Estate in Milton, and I bet he didn't know that he'd be sponsoring um, videos in the rain, but this is the first one that has been in the rain, and we've been doing it for a number of months now, so we've been pretty lucky, um, and we're lucky that Don is here, who has um, a lot of patience with us as well. Um, so so I, moved, I moved to the uh, just south of Boston area about 30 years ago, and I've been... Uh, spending a lot of time looking at the insect populations. And when I, when I first came out here, my friend Jane O'Donnell that I told you about and I would do insect trapping and we found all sorts of new and rare species. But that has gradually diminished over the years. And there's a lot of reasons why this has happened because partially it's the impact of development and losing the space for the animals to live in because we need a certain amount of area for certain species to survive. And the, in, along with that infringement on the space and habitat that the animals live in, there's also pesticides and herbicides that people are putting on their lawns that uh, have a big impact on insect populations. And more recently, people are using mosquito misters that are having a devastating effect on insect populations and to some degree humans as well because you can imagine spraying pesticides into the air has a health deficit that um, for some people that are really sensitive causes seizures others the insecticide gets caught up in the fats in your body and when you're under stress it's released and it weakens your immune system and uh, talking about weakened immune systems, one of the species that's gotten hit really hard are bees. And you may have heard about the shrinking bee populations and the inability of beekeepers to keep their hives alive. And scientists were just totally baffled. You know, they wondered, you know, why is this happening? And at first we thought, well, maybe it's just pesticides. But we also learned uh, from research that it's also herbicides that, that are killing them. And the weakening of their immune systems allows viruses and also mite populations to take over the colonies. So just like everything in ecology, it's a multifactorial process that causes the changes. So not only have I seen a diminution in the number of insects, but that's changing the plant fauna because a lot of insects are pollinators for the plants. And when you lose those pollinators, then you lose species that depend on those pollinators um, to keep on going. So every little bit of change that we make by encroaching on insect populations, for instance, insects clean up dead animals, they clean the detritus off the ground, this place would be a mess without the billions of insects around us cleaning up um, as part of their life cycles the mess that other plants and animals make. 
and you will see a change in uh, the ecosystem, not just from people building houses, but these gradual impacts on the insect population. That's great. So I think you've touched on kind of why we would care um, about insects. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, just I, well, in I, terms I, of like there's 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 more to it in terms of the ecosystem and all of all of that. So there's a. Well, story there. Some things are just I iconic. For instance, the monarch butterfly populations have been something that North America is famous for. Everybody kind of measures their year by when the monarchs show up and when they head back down south. They're amazing because they have these thousands of miles of uh, migrations to get to their overwintering sites in Mexico and the mountains. And so, just like the populations of insects here in Southern Mass, the populations of monarchs have been hit by the same things, especially because most of the habitat that they go through is in the Midwest, a lot of it, and the agriculture in the Midwest is having a serious, uh, causing a serious decline in the monarch butterfly populations. So the crash uh, was, really huge in the early 2000s and then it sort of came back and uh, running up to about 2005 2006 and then after 2010 it's been an enormous decline so that we're probably looking in an era where monarch butterflies won't be an everyday beautiful part of our walks out in the wild uh, the other piece that strikes me is just kind of like who eats the insects and then kind of like people might not care about mosquitoes or um, some of the um, less beautiful insects, but they do care about the animals and birds that depend on them. So Judy, that's a great point. They're uh, the fly catchers and uh, a lot of other birds that insects aren't their main food, but it is supplemental to, to, to their diets depend on dense insect populations. And even insects like dragonflies are big consumers of uh, the mosquitoes and the midges. Um, that's their main source of food. So anything that happens to any part of the ecosystem, whether it's the fungi that lives in the ground under us, the grass and the trees and uh, plants that live on top, or the animals that live in those and feed on the insects, those populations all are interacting in a way that we're seeing a huge shift in what's going on in North America and around the world. Germany has had over a 95% drop in their insect populations in the last 10 years. This is not exclusive to our part of the world. This is a phenomenon of we, when my mother was born 87 years ago, there were two billion people in the world. We now have seven and a half billion people in the world. There is a limit on the space and the resources to feed the humans and the animals. And the changes that we're seeing are a result of the expansion of the human population affects everything in our environment, including changes in the climate. Um, so now we have to fess up that we're not actually in the Blue Hills at the moment. Um, we are at Borderland State Park because it was easier um, logistically for Don to get here. Um, and that's where you're, this is where you've done a lot of your observation work as well. So um, uh, can you, how, how does it compare to like if you were observing things in Houghton's Pond compared to the Borderland? Pretty much the same. Um, if there are fish in the pond, that determines what sort of species of insects live in that pond. And if there are not fish, then you uh, have a whole different uh, ecosystem of insects and amphibians that uh, live in the ponds. So the presence of predators is a key element in the structure of the communities that uh, live in the ponds. And Houghton Pond has fish. And so, so I just want to interrupt you. Kimberly Moody says, LOL in the rain. Aren't you worried about lightning and falling trees? <laughs> <laughs> well, the falling trees, no. The lightning, 
I'm not holding my breath, but I haven't heard anything really intimidating yet. So I think we're safe for now. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for your concern and thanks for writing in. Um, uh, oh, my, I was thinking if you are interested in Houghton's Pond, as opposed to um, Portland Police Pond, um, you can download our free guide to the Blue Hills, which is at friendsofthebluehills.org slash guide. And um, there you can learn the uses, what, what, um, what was going on in Houghton's Pond before it was a park. Um, so let's get back uh, to insects. Um, you are going to specifically um, find some um, aquatic insects. Do you want to talk us through what you would have found and why they would have been interesting? So. And the only reason he didn't find them was because it's pouring out. <laughs> so, so because life evolved in the ocean, and then uh, emerged onto land, aquatic insects actually were land insects that moved back into the water. And one of the complexities of living in the water is if you started on land and you're used to breathing oxygen from the air, how do you breathe oxygen in the water? And insects have come up with a variety of different interesting ways to solve that problem. So many of you probably, if you have a swimming pool or even you are at Houghton Pond or uh, in some other, uh, near some other wadi, water body, have seen these insects that kind of move through the water in a jerky fashion and then they'll float up to the surface. They're called back swimmers and they're predators on other little uh, invertebrates. And what they do is they have some hydrophobic, that means that it pushes away water, hairs that break through the surface tension of the water and they breathe water in through their rear end. <laughs> and then they have hairs underneath their body that holds a bubble of oxygen under, uh, underneath them and they can swim around getting invertebrates catching their prey deep in the water for quite a long time because it doesn't take a whole lot of oxygen to keep an insect going. Other insects, like the water scorpion, for instance, has a long snorkel that sticks off of its rear end and it's shaped like a stick and it's got raptorial arms so that it can grab its prey and stick its piercing sucking mouth parts into it and suck, squirt some enzymes in and suck the juices out and get its meal. But the way that it stays still, it's a sit and wait predator, is it because it looks like a stick, grabs on to some sort of aquatic vegetation and it sticks its snorkel up out of the water and it breathes again through its rear end this long straw-like appendage that comes off uh, the end of the insect. Other insects, a, a lot of mosquito larvae and uh, the deer fly that bite us, their larvae live in the water, they actually absorb oxygen through their skin. So they've changed the structure of their integument, that's what we call the covering of an insect, um, so that they can actually absorb oxygen right into the body and that's enough uh, for them. And there's actually a midge larvae called the blood worm and it has hemoglobin in it just like we do so that they can hold the oxygen and transport it. And so the, the larvae are these red color from the hemoglobin that's uh, in the larvae. So either they get the uh, air from going up to the surface and grabbing it, or they have ways of osmotically just pulling it through the water into their bodies. But very interesting how you can go uh, from a terrestrial to an aquatic habitat and uh, how you have to adapt in order to survive. Um, so, just so you know, Carol Contoy McGuire O'Keefe says hello. Hi. <laughs> hi, <laughs> Carol. For saying hi. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions, please let us know in the comments below. Um, are you still okay with the thunder? Well, it's getting better. You know, I, I think we got a little bit of action, but it didn't sound very close. Yeah. <laughs> how about you? How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> Probably we should wrap up soon. Okay. Um, let, let us know if you have comments. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to say? Like, actually, I did want to know, um, are there things that, uh, um, that, that uh, 
insects would need um, for a healthy environment. And so there are a lot of plants like black-eyed Susan and columbine and uh, different daisy family plants that are really attractive to butterflies and bees and wasps. And if you plant those around your house, you'll see more insects as long as you don't spray insecticides all over uh, those uh, areas. And um, I would encourage people to do less of putting toxic things into the environment. You can take care of your yard with more natural uh, methods than using these heavy duty insecticides and, and herbicides. Um, you know, just go out and pull some weeds instead of using Roundup or some other uh, toxic compound that uh, is tough on the environment and especially the insects in our environment. And one last question is, um, I forgot it. <laughs> oh, protected land like um, Blue Hill um, or Borderland, um, is that kind of any, um, are, are there still threats to insects um, in these lands that we consider like state parks that are preserved and, and pristine? So, so the uh, parks are, and preserved lands are reservoirs for insect populations. But as I said earlier, it's the amount of land that determines the diversity of animals in the area. So the more protected area you have, the more diversity of plants and animals that you will uh, have in, in that uh, region. And so it's important, even for people that buy a fair amount of acreage, rather than to, to turn it into a lawn, to just leave it natural and let the trees and the shrubs and uh, plants develop. And you'll have fabulous insect populations and a much healthier environment as a result. Yay, thank you. And thank you for watching. And um, thank you doubly for going in the rain. <laughs> I, you're watching Blue Hills Alive, your weekly guide to the Blue Hills every Thursday at noon, rain or shine apparently. And this is sponsored by Tom O'Neill of Success Real Estate in Milton. And if you want to learn more about the Blue Hills, you can download a free guide at friendsofthebluehills.org slash guide. And we'll see you next Thursday at noon. Bye.